So the quiz tomorrow is going to cover all of chapter 9 from the textbook. Um, it's only a, a front and back. Um, you will be required to know some mechanistic details, but we'll cover which mechanisms you do need to know and which ones you don't um, a little later in lecture. Uh, make sure that you get sapling done early. Please don't leave it until the morning before the quiz, because at that point it's really not going to help you that much, and um, I won't have the time to necessarily help you with questions if um, there's a line out the door. So the last reaction we have for chapter 9 is a really common reaction. It's pretty famous. And this is called catalytic hydrogenation. Catalytic hydrogenation involves converting an alkene to an alkane. It's a pretty simple reaction. And in order to do this, you have to slam your molecule with hydrogen gas. So we'll use H2. And the activation energy for this reaction is super duper high. If you just squeeze it together with hydrogen, your reaction will go very slowly, if at all. So the trick we do is we have to use some sort of metal catalyst to lower the activation energy. And in this case, the most common catalysts involve platinum or palladium. And usually it's metal that's um, embedded on carbon. So when you go to the lab, you might see palladium on carbon, and then it says palladium 5%. Um, it's a pretty common um, reagent. What's the downside to these metals? They're super expensive. So these are used sparingly, but they are catalytic, so you can uh, recycle and or recover them after the reaction's over. The other important thing with this reaction is that the addition of your hydrogens is going to be syn. So I'll draw the two hydrogens that we've added in as wedges, and we'll call this syn addition. In this case, it doesn't really matter that much because there's no stereocenters in our final product, but it does matter if you are forming a stereocenter. The most common industrial use for hydrogenation involves fats. So typically, fatty acids that are derived from vegetable oils have some sort of double bond in them. These are referred to as unsaturated fats, right? Are these solids or liquids? Yeah, generally liquids. So vegetable oils tend to be liquids with the exception of a few. And you can imagine if we try to do a hydrogenation reaction, we can take whoop, H2 and we can do <coughs> palladium catalyst and all of a sudden we've converted it into a saturated fat, which conveniently is a solid, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, Oop, thank you. And these saturated fats are solids. This was a really big commercial success in the early 1900s because there was a big shortage of, um, of animal fats, specifically during World War I and World War II, and we figured out how to make um, animal fat-like substances through hydrogenating vegetable oils. What's the downside of this reaction? Yeah, oftentimes during these reactions, you get incomplete hydrogenation, um, which results in some of these trans fats forming. If you look over here, this fat is cis, which is our natural um, form of fat, and we can isomerize this on accident to the trans fat. Oftentimes, um, they try to get around this by um, adding back in some um, good fats. So if you look at Crisco today, Crisco isn't trans fat free, um, but they do try to supplement um, the Crisco with things like uh, coconut oil, which is a solid fat and is a lot better for you. So oftentimes the labels, when you see trans fat free on them, they are partially hydrogenated vegetable, oil, vegetable oils, but the trans fat content is below 5%. Um, and so they can get away with calling it trans fat free. So free is anything below 5%. Yeah, free is anything below 5%, thanks to some good lobbying by food industry groups. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at a couple of examples here. Let's determine what the product would be for this hydrogenation, and I want you to focus on stereochemistry, too. Are we looking at another reaction mechanism? 
Nope, in this case, we don't need to know the reaction mechanism. The reaction mechanism involves um, some pretty goofy surface chemistry with the metal and hydrogen. You can read about it a little bit in the book if you'd like, though. So are we going to get one product, two products? Are we going to get a mixture of products? What do you guys think? So let's take a look, right? We know it's going to be syn addition. So we could say, you know what? There's one hydrogen coming off here. There's one hydrogen coming off here. And our methyl groups are sticking back. Will I have an enantiomer? No. Why not? Meso. It's a meso compound, right? So in this case, syn addition can result in stereocenters. However, watch out for meso compounds because you're not always going to get a mixture of enantiomers out. This catalyst system, if we look at it here, actually, I'll circle just the platinum, is referred to as a heterogeneous catalyst. Which is really just a fancy way of saying that the catalyst doesn't dissolve. These are really commonly used. However, more and more chemists are switching towards homogeneous catalysts, and I'll show you why in a second. But let's take a look at a common homogeneous catalyst. And for this one, we're going to use hydrogen gas again. But the catalyst, instead of platinum or palladium, is now going to be a ruthenium complex. So we've got ruthenium with a chloride ligand, which just means that the chlorine's bound to the ruthenium. And then these ligands called triphenylphosphine ligands. What does the pH stand for? Yeah, a phenyl ring. So it's just that benzene ring that's covalently bound to phosphorus, and there's three of them. And then we've got three of those ligands all bound around ruthenium. This is referred to as a homogeneous catalyst. Did you say bound by chlorine? Um, I'm not to say it's chelated or chelated or whatever it's called, C-H-E-L-A-T-E-D. -E. Yeah, it's acting as a ligand, so you do have an organometallic covalent bond between ruthenium and chlorine. Okay. So this is referred to as a homogeneous catalyst. And these do dissolve. For the most part, they behave almost identically to um, the catalysts um, above. So what do you guys think the product or products will be out of this? And let's focus on stereochemistry again. And I know this can be a little hard to see up here, but this is a wedge. going to get one product, two products? What do you guys think? Two. two? Okay, so let's draw this out. We know if we do this addition, this top methyl group is going to be untouched. And then we could have two hydrogens adding across this top face, which means this other methyl group's got to be a dash now. Or we could have two hydrogens add from that back side. So I'll turn this hydrogen into a dash this hydrogen into a dash, and that means this methyl group is now going to be a wedge. What's the relationship between these? <coughs> diastereomers. So in this case, we've instead of making a mixture of enantiomers, we've actually made a mixture of diastereomers. Is that still racemic, or is there a difference? That's a good question. So racemic um, mixtures are always going to be 50-50 mixtures of enantiomers. In this case, it's just a 50-50 mixture of completely um, different compounds. Like I said, enantiomers have the same physical properties. Diastereomers do not. So you could actually easily separate these out using techniques like distillation or chromatography. 
Okay, so the question is, why the heck would we use such a fancy looking catalyst instead of just platinum or palladium? And the reality has to do with the desire to make one enantiomer or one diastereomer over the other, right? We don't wanna always get a mixture of products out of these reactions if we can avoid it. So let's make a little note of this. This ligand can be changed to a chiral ligand Whoop. which will result in one face of the alkene getting preferentially reduced. So really what you have to do is put on some big bulky chiral ligand on there and that will allow it to dock with one side of the alkene and deliver hydrogens but not the other side. So they're using a, a fancy ligand in this case to um, favor one enantiomer or diastereomer over the other. Does that make sense? We're not gonna get into that and I don't expect you guys to know all the chiral ligands, but they are presented in your book and you may see some example problems in the book as well that involve um, funky looking um, reagents. The key thing to look for though is hydrogen and some metal. Um, if you see hydrogen in a metal, there's a fair chance that it's going to be a hydrogenation reaction. So in this case, would that be unable to go to, I assume it's going to go for the top face of the double bond because it's the more available one. It, it depends a lot on the ligand that's used. Um, usually you won't know which one will work better until you experimentally test it out. And even then it won't be 100% um, one or the other. It might be like 95% and 5%. That's where we get into issues like enantiomeric excess. Too, but you typically have to experimentally um, do something like that before you know. All right, so that's more or less the last reaction for chapter nine, but we are gonna do a little bit of concept review. At the end of every chapter, I kind of like to tie things back together again. And the first thing we're gonna review is regiochemistry. This is another way of saying is the reaction Markovnikov. Or anti-Markovnikov. So I'm just going to have our generic reaction and then I'll say, all right, we've got this alkene. And with Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov reactions, typically what you're adding is in some sort of hydrogen and you're going to be adding in some other group and we'll call this other group A for now. So we'll just call this addition of H and A. So with Markovnikov addition, are we going to add A to the more substituted side of the alkene or less substituted side? More substituted, all right? So we can have A added onto this side, hydrogen on the other side, or we can have A added on to the less substituted side and the hydrogen added on to the more substituted side. So we said that this would be Markovnikov and this one would be anti-Markovnikov. All right, so I'm gonna throw out some reaction names and I want you guys to help me decide which regiochemistry is more likely. All right, acid catalyzed hydration. That's where we use water and catalytic acid. Is that going to be Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov? Markov. Markovnikov, right? So if we have water and some sort of acid source, it's always going to favor Markovnikov.
All right, what about hydroboration oxidation? That's where we have BH3, THF, and then we've got sodium hydroxide, hydrogen peroxide in step two. That'll do anti-Markov and Markov addition of alcohols, right? Okay, what about oxymercuration, demercuration? Is that going to do Markovnikov addition of an alcohol or anti-Markovnikov? Markovnikov. Markovnikov, right? Why would we use uh, oxymercuration, demercuration instead of acid catalyzed hydration? Avoid yeah, avoid rearrangement. So oxymercuration, demercuration is Markovnikov, but we know it's used if we want to avoid any possible rearrangement chemistry. All right, what about hydrohalogenation? That's where we do something like HBr or HCl. Will that do Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov? Yeah, it depends if there's peroxide presence, right? So in this case, hydrohalogenation, whoa. will favor Markovnikov when there's no peroxides. So I'll write without peroxides. And then we know it will do anti-Markovnikov if there are peroxides. What about Halogenation, if we have Br2, is it going to be Markovnikov, anti-Markovnikov, or can we really say? Oh, no. Yeah, we really can't say. We can only refer to something as Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov when we're adding in hydrogen and then another group. So these are kind of the limitations of defining regiochemistry. All right, so besides regiochemistry, we've got to focus a lot on stereochemistry. So not only which atom um, the, the new bond is at, but whether or not that uh, bond is going to be a dash or a wedge. So let's take a look at stereochemistry. This is another way of saying, is it sin or anti-addition? So in this case, I'm going to change up the reaction a little. We're going to say we're going to add two molecules, or sorry, two atoms. We'll add X and Y. And we know syn addition is when they are delivered to the same face of the alkene. So I'll do X as a wedge and Y as a wedge. And in this case, we would also have an enantiomer, so I'll write plus En. And in the other case, we could have anti-addition, where one is a wedge and the other is a dash. So this was our sin addition. And this one's going to be our anti addition. All right, so we said halogenation with Br2, we can't refer to it as Markovnikov or anti Markovnikov because it's delivering two identical substituents. But is it going to be syn addition or anti addition if we deliver Br2 to an alkene? Anti addition. So in this case, we could say halogenation. is always going to be anti-addition. That's when we have Br2 or Cl2 across a pi bond. All right, what about if we want to form a syndiol? What would we call that reaction? What reagents do we need? Oh, that's the H3O. So halogenation, we said we would need something like Br2. If we want syn dihydroxylation hydroxylation. 
we can use potassium permanganate, sodium hydroxide, and run it cold, right? What's another set of reagents we could use instead of potassium permanganate? Yeah, the osmium tetroxide. And then step two, we have to reduce off that osmium. So we use sodium bisulfite and water. Both of these can be used for syn dihydroxylation. Somebody was asking me earlier, why are there two possible routes? The reality is oftentimes with these reactions, there's more than one way to get from point A to point B. Potassium permanganate is a really, really strong oxidant. It can do other side reactions, so it's generally avoided um, if there's some side chemistry that can occur. What's the problem again with osmium tetroxide? Blind. It can make you go blind. So really it's picking the lesser of two evils and trying to find which route's um, the safest for your chemist and which route's going to minimize your side reactions. Okay, what about if we want anti-dihydroxylation? So we want our alcohols to be added on opposite faces. What reagents would we use? Yeah, MCPBA. Oop. So we'll write this out first. Anti-dihydroxylation. And we said this would be MCPBA. And then in step two, what do we need? An acid, right? So H3O plus. All right, I'm actually going to change the color of these if I can. Oh, I'll do it later. Okay, so we've got two different ways of adding alcohol, sin, and anti to one another. What about hydroboration oxidation? We're adding in hydrogen and an alcohol. We know it's going to be anti-Markovnikov, but is it going to be sin or anti? It's a little bit tricky. So in this case, it's going to be syn addition, but we're looking at the hydrogen that's added and the alcohol that's added. And we said in order to do this, we're going to have BH3 THF followed by what? Yeah, peroxide and sodium hydroxide. And I'm going to put in a little asterisk under here that says sin with respect to the hydrogen. So in your final product, the hydrogen that's added in will be sin to that alcohol. All right, what about the halohydrin reaction? What's that reaction? Anti, right? And what do we need for the halohydrin reaction? We need bromine and what? Water. water. So it's really similar to halogenation. It's just water is going to outcompete. That's when we have Br2 and water. And then last but not least, what about hydrogenation? Sin. And we said typically this would be something like hydrogen gas and we would have palladium. And normally we said this palladium is going to be embedded on carbon. So I think this more or less covers all of the stereochemistry for the reactions we've seen. And then last but not least, we've got some reactions that involve an odd looking intermediate. So I'd like to make a concept review for that. And these involve reactions that have some sort of intermediate with a ring, specifically a three-membered ring. So I'll call this Z.
and I'm going to put a positive charge on Z because every time we've seen it in a ring system, there's always a positive charge. And in these reactions, we typically have some sort of nucleophile. The nucleophile sometimes has a charge, sometimes doesn't, but it's always a nucleophile. Which side of the ring is attacked? Yeah, the more substituted side. So in this case, let's draw the arrow pushing. We said that the nucleophile is always going to attack the more substituted side and slingshot this open. Which results in X being on the less substituted side. Oh, sorry. <laughs> It should be Z. All right, so the question is, which situations have we seen these three-membered rings? And we said that we saw this when Z is bromine, right? So the bromonium ion, we have that bromine in the three-membered ring. It's got a positive charge. This can happen with chlorine, too. It can happen when you've got oxygen in there. That's when we treat this with MCPBA, right? So with MCPBA, we form that three-membered ring with oxygen. We call that an epoxide. And then in step two, we protonate it. And then water will attack the more substituted side after that. And then last but not least, we could have a three-membered ring where there's mercury. And specifically, it's got an acetate group attached. So all three or four of these um, proceed through a very similar mechanism. So the nucleophile... will attack the more substituted side if Z has a positive charge. So it's pretty straightforward for these, and we'll come back to this a lot more when we get into epoxides. You guys ready for some review? A little bit. <laughs> All right, I'll show you guys some uh, study aids I like to do, and then we'll clarify which mechanisms you need to know. So in the notebook and at the end of the chapter, we've got a bunch of reactions listed in kind of this flowchart format. I really like these end of chapter summaries. They're really useful for reviewing. And in this case, I'm going to mark the reactions where I don't want you guys to know the mechanism with an asterisk. So in this case, we'll do a red asterisk. We said osmium tetroxide, we don't need to know the mechanism. KMNO4, we don't need to know the mechanism. And then for this reaction, the anti-dial one, I said just skip directly to the epoxide, that three-membered ring, and then show the ring opening. So you, you don't need to show the mechanism for the epoxide formation. You should show the mechanism for the halo-hydrogen reaction. That's the Br2 in water. You should show the mechanism for... A, um, halogenation, that's with Br2. And then this hydrogenation reaction right here, you don't need to show the mechanism for, but you should show the final product. And then same thing with this reaction over here, hydroboration, oxidation, you don't need to show the mechanism for. For the oxymercuration, demercuration, um, in general, I don't ask you guys to know the mechanism for that, but I do believe it asks some questions on sapling, so you do want to pull open your textbook for that. Um, I do want you guys to know acid catalyzed hydration. Um, you don't need to show the mechanism for the reaction with peroxides um, because that's a radical reaction that we haven't covered yet. You should be able to show the hydrohalogenation reaction, and last but not least, you don't need to show the ozonolysis reaction. So the good news is, do I have to show any? <laughs> let's just circle the ones we do need to know. You do need to know the hydrohalogenation, acid catalyzed hydration, romination, and halo reaction, and then this addition of water. Oh, right. the HBR, right? It's what? not the one that. Oh, no. Which one? The HBR? Wait, number two? Uh, this one involves a radical mechanism that we haven't covered yet. So really, there's only five mechanisms you need to know for this one. Um, there's a lot of reactions, but try to focus on the core mechanisms for those five. Yep. So the ones that we don't need to know, so 
so we just need to know what goes in it and what would come out? Exactly. You need to know whether or not it's um, going to be Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov, and you need to know whether or not your product will be sin or anti. So I know it looks like a lot. Try to spend a good chunk of time um, getting comfortable with these because um, tomorrow, after we're done with our quiz, we're going to dive straight, straight into Chapter 10. Um, the good news is Chapter 10 looks a lot like Chapter 9. A lot of the reactions are similar with alkenes and alkynes. The other thing I've included in the course notebook is basically this with all of the reagents removed. So I had students last year that would print off copies of this, fill it in. If they forgot one, they'd be like, hey, I need to study this, or I need to really remember my hydrohalogenation reaction. So you can print this off and use it as a study guide. It's pretty helpful. And then some people were asking me, what practice problems do you really recommend doing? Um, I normally say all of them. But if you have to triage your time, I really like problem 950 from the book and 971. And so what we're going to do with the remaining chunk of class period is we're going to spend some time working on 950 and 971 as small groups. And then last but not least, if you have the solutions manual, the solutions manual at the beginning of each chapter has a really comprehensive review guide. Um, so make sure that you check that out too um, and you can use that as a study aid. There's a lot of good tips and tricks in the study guide that will help you out. So I'm going to stop the recording and then what I'll have you guys do is work as uh, small teams to try to figure out some of these practice problems. <laughs>